It is 11.34. Um, just to give Jacob Rees-Mogg a brief break from our scrutiny, here is a, an MP called Bob Seeley. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's, uh, he's the MP for the Isle of Wight. He's just written this to his constituents. I voted that I had confidence in the Prime Minister as leader of the Conservative Party, although not without some consideration and only after discussion with senior ministers. It is clear that some foolish errors were made during Partygate. Boris has apologised. I hope now that he can focus on governing. I talked again with ministers about why a fair funding package has not yet been forthcoming for the Isle of Wight Council. I have been assured that they will look at this again and will do so in the very near future. So there you go. I, I mean, you're not supposed to tell people that you've been bribed and not even bribed with a cheque, but bribed with the promise of a cheque, Bob. I don't know. I, I mean, is this yet more evidence of how the fish rots from the head down? I, I, you, you're not supposed to tell us this bit, Bob, are you? Remarkable. And speaking of other MPs, just to give J Dog a brief um, uh, respite from our scrutiny of his epic dishonesty and, and dissembling, here is everybody's favourite food bank fan, Lee Anderson, MP. Um, well, just have a little listen. It's as simple as that. People yes. don't look at the Prime Minister's yeah, character. Of course and think, they do. Of he's course a man who's lied to the Queen, lied to the House of Commons, lied to the public, I and they what, don't trust what him. What people anymore. see, Geeta, is a witch hunt led by the BBC, led by the Labour well, Party the, and the mainstream. Well, it's the Labour, it's the Conservative, it's the Conservative MPs who voted, not, not any of the media. It's led by the BBC, for Boris from day one. It's been a massive witch hunt. It's about time he got off his back. Let him crack on when we run the country. Come back and talk to me in two years' time when he's delivered on his promises, and then we'll see where we are. There is no witch hunt, I can assure you, from no, there BBC is a witch hunt. or any uh, this of... My inbox of... is full of people complaining about the BBC all the time, saying it should be defunded. It's a massive witch hunt by you and the Labour Party and the mainstream media. You're on his case all the time. Even now, you're not going to let this drop, are you? You're going to go, oh, on and on and on. Well, the re- it's, just, it's, it's, it's not about sad. letting us drop, and it is not a witch hunt by anyone in the press. Our job is to ask questions of all politicians, which is what we do, regardless yeah. of party. I don't know if Lee Anderson actually has a brain cell to call his own. I've never, ever, ever I mean, I'm talking, and, and it's funny, isn't it? Because we talk about accents, and I, I wonder how D- Jacob Rees Mogg would have fared if he'd had an accent like Lee Anderson's. But they are peas in a pod. They are just spectacularly stupid. Dominic Raab tried it on with another BBC journalist yesterday, attempting to claim that there was some sort of bias, some sort of partisanship. But Lee Anderson there claiming that 148 Conservative MPs expressing a a lack of confidence in Boris Johnson is somehow the consequence of a BBC witch hunt. I've got a pretty good vocabulary. I hope you don't think that that's an arrogant thing for me to say. And in fact, sometimes I, I lean towards the sesquipedalian in my pursuit of excessively long words. But I don't think there's a word that quite fits that level of thickness from, from Lee Anderson. And, I, I, I mean, and this is our body politics. This is our parliament. That's absolutely incredible. For, for 148 Tory MPs have lost confidence in Boris Johnson because of a BBC witch hunt. And because his inbox is full of rubbish from racists, he somehow thinks that that is true. I'll tell you what, if a hundred of us send Lee Anderson an email saying that the moon is made of cheese and it's only because of a BBC witch hunt that everyone keeps pretending it's made of moon, do you think he'll go on the telly and, and, and say that everybody knows the moon is actually made of cheese and it's all the consequence of a BBC witch hunt that everybody keeps insisting that moon is made of moon? And don't listen to a word that Neil Armstrong bloke says either because he's part of the witch hunt as well. And pro- It is absolutely breathtaking. And speaking about that biased media, here's the best-selling newspaper in the country, Boris Vows, I'll bash on. Here is the second best-selling newspaper in the country, Night of the Blonde Knife, stabbed in back by 148 Tories. Damn that biased media, honestly. And the BBC asking simple questions about how 148 Conservative MPs could have lost confidence in a Conservative Prime Minister, only to be told that it's a consequence of a Labour and BBC-led witch hunt. Oh, Lee Anderson, Lee Anderson, Lee Anderson. Um, 11.38 is the time. Should we summon the Usherwood? I think we probably should. We haven't heard from Theo Usherwood today. These are days of political intrigue. So who better to join us than... Well, summon the Usherwood, please. Hello. Hello, James. Just very quickly on the Bob Seeley question, Mm. the point that you made just now. When I bumped into him yesterday, about 11 o'clock yesterday morning, I did ask him which way he was going to vote. And he said at that point he hadn't made up his mind. Uh. So one would presume that the meeting with ministers about this funding for the Isle of Wight took place after that point, at which 
at which point he decided that actually he was going to uh, support um, the Prime Minister. But the point, of course, he's making to his constituents on the Isle of Wight is, look what leverage I've managed to use to secure you more money um, for uh, the well, council. Well, let's just not to split hairs, me old fruit, <laughs> but he's secured a promise of more money from oh, right, Boris yes, Johnson's course. closest allies. <laughs> Yes. Yes, a promise, I'll say those words again for anyone in the Isle of Wight listening to this, he's secured a promise from Boris Johnson's closest allies. Let's just remind ourselves of one of <laughs> Boris Johnson's closest allies. No, I'll do it again. We've played those clips enough. To what do we owe this pleasure, Theo Rushu? Well, as well as Lee Anderson speaking this morning to the Prime Minister, another MP uh, loyal to the PM has been uh, speaking, uh, he spoke to me, in fact, he's called Jacob Young. He's the MP uh, for Red Car. Red Car, isn't it? Yes. Red, Red Car. And I, and I asked uh, Mr Young what persuaded him uh, to uh, support the Prime Minister in yesterday's vote of confidence. He explained that he felt as though the cost of living on families was too high. Yeah. We need to get down the cost of housing. We need to get down the cost of energy. Um, but crucially, we also need to get down the cost of taxation. That's his focus and that's a... So that's what you'd like to see, tax cuts? Well, as I say, the, that's what the Prime Minister outlined in the 22 yesterday and I, I support his agenda. But do you, do you recognise that the tax burden is the highest since World War II and the, under the Conservatives? Well, uh, that's, that's, what, that's what you're telling me, but the Prime Minister said yesterday, one of the biggest costs for households is taxation. Yeah. He wants to see that reduced and I support him in trying to do that. But him and Rishi Sunak have put it up to levels never seen under Tony Blair or Gordon Brown. Yeah, well, I mean, Theo, we've had, a, we've had a pandemic, we spent £407 billion. Pounds. Where do you think that money's coming from? Yeah, Where I mean, uh, true, true but, but then, you've got, then you want tax cuts. Yeah, well, exa but exa exactly. But it's, it's, about, it's about how you, how you manage that process, bringing down the cost of living for families, helping ensure that those who can afford to pay more, uh, you know, carry, carry the heaviest burden, um, and those who can't, you know, that we, that we support them through that. So we all slightly rushed there, James, because we were walking through College Green back to um, Westminster. That's why I was both slightly breathless from Mr Young and from myself. I, I, did, you, did you... I mean, there were two things. I, 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 right. Not that you need any guidance from me, but I, I think it would have been nice to give the old airing to the, to the line. That's not an opinion, it's just counting. But also, I, when, did, I did say facts. I, no, no, I know, um, I'm teasing you. But when he used the word exactly, are we sure he knows what the word exactly means? So you usually say exactly when somebody makes a point, you go, ah, exactly, you're right. Yes. But he did it the other way around, didn't he? I think he did, yes. <laughs> yeah. I I'm not yeah. even going to try and pronounce it exactly backwards, but I think that's kind of what, what so he did. So he said exactly my point when he was saying exactly his point. Yes. So it wasn't really exactly, it was the opposite of exactly. What is the opposite of exactly? Not remotely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he, <would> <laughs> <laughs> he should have said not remotely. Yes. talking, that's not correct. Um, that's not remotely what, what I'm saying. What has happened? I don't know how many of them you've had to speak to today, but what's happened to all the delivering for the British people? I haven't managed to find... Um, I haven't managed to find... Do you know but, what but, I wanted to do yesterday? I forgot to tell you. I don't know if you fancy this, but I've got the crib sheet still. I've got yesterday's ludicrous yeah. hymn sheet in front of me. And I thought we could do some role-playing where I would be the Conservative MP using the hymn sheet and you would be... Yeah political rottweiler Theo Ushwood's LBC political editor are asking me questions and I, I would see whether I could perform a little bit better than, well it wouldn't be hard, but a little bit better than for example Jacob Young just did with you there. Okay. It's rather so, sonorous. So, if, so, so I, I will say, I'll ask you James, Yeah. what persuaded you to vote for the Prime Minister? Well, Theo, we secured the biggest majority since 1987 and secured the highest share of the vote, 43.6% of any party since 1979, winning 14 million votes. That's not correct. What? 14 million votes. Oh, what, back in 2019? No, th yeah, but last yeah. night. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, this is vote, typical James of the sort of LBC witch hunt <laughs> that people like you go on when you're dealing with the simple facts about Boris Johnson's basic brilliance. You're probably friends with that James O'Brien bloke, aren't you? Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> go on, give me one more. OK. Um, wh what does the Prime Minister need to do over the next two years to secure a, a victory in the next election? Well, I, I think we all know that the Prime Minister needs to deliver for the British people and also he needs to deliver for the British people while, and this I think is the crucial point, Theo, that a lot of his detractors at the BBC and the woke mob are missing, he also needs to deliver for the British people while delivering for the British people, Theo. I've got a final question. What's he going to deliver? 
Exactly. <laughs> Theo Ashwood live from College Green. A little bit of help there from my colleague Keith, just in case you heard it bleed out of my earphones. I wouldn't want to deny credit where credit is due. Uh, it's amazing, isn't it? And, and these two clips here of Jacob Rees-Mogg are absolutely shaming. And I, and I mean what I say about vocabulary. I, 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 I row back from using some of the really strong words. Um, because I know that something worse is going to happen a week down the line or a month down the line, and I'll have used up the strong word already. So what word have I got to describe the new thing that's happened? For example, thick in the context of Lee Anderson or Jacob Rees-Mogg. It's not big enough anymore to describe, or, or dishonest in the case of Jacob Rees-Mogg, dissembling, contradictory, double-think. Orwell had to invent his own words to describe the level of moral corruption now being displayed by Jacob Rees-Mogg. He actually had to invent new words to describe what was happening in front of his eyes. And so he invented the word doublethink to describe exactly what Jacob Rees-Mogg was doing yesterday on national television. I mean, the mind truly boggles. I would love to speak to you if your mind is not boggling and that you actually can make some sort of sense of this or tell me why you still, as an earlier caller suggested, you still think he's deserving of your respect or your support after he... I mean, there's not even pretending to tell the truth anymore. I, I mean, the more I think... I mean, I do this every day, as you know, and, and I, I'm not exactly a fully paid-up member of the Jacob Rees-Mogg fan club, as, as you also know. I, I just... I, mean, I knew he was talking through his hat when he sold you Brexit, but I feel appalled on your behalf for, for the fact that he managed to... Him and his ilk managed to mislead so many of my fellow countrymen and women. So it's, it's a very generous dislike uh, that, that, that I have developed for him and his fellow liars. But even I'm stunned today by the scale of this dissembling. I, I, I'll just remind you again what he had to say when Theresa May received 117 votes of no confidence as Conservative leader. This is a very bad result for the Prime Minister. 117 votes against her, much worse than she thought. And what he had to say when Boris Johnson received 148 Good victory for the Prime Minister. Uh, he won comfortably and now he is getting on business. The mind boggles. It truly does. 10 to 12 is the time. Tim's in Ilkeston. Um, that is where Robert Lindsay is from, isn't it? Hi, James. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, could I say the first, um, first time caller? Well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have misled you like that because I, I just did a little name drop at the top of the, at the, top of the call there. Because Robert Lindsay's from Ilkeston, isn't he? The actor. Sorry, the line's gone a bit crackly. I think it's because I'm talking gibberish and you don't quite understand what's happened because you come on to talk about politics and I'm name-dropping one of my favourite actors into the conversation just because he comes from the town that you're calling yeah. me from. <laughs> yes, so, yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah. So we'll park that and start yeah, again. Tim, Tim's in Ilkeston. That's where Robert Lindsay comes from, I believe. But Hello. let's not talk about that now. Tim, what's on your mind? <laughs> um, well, I wanted to just... Um, uh, um, you know, give a, a yeah. You know, a, a reply to um, your comment earlier about yes. um, about about uh, Reese Mogg uh, and yes. and not being a rule breaker. Um, you know, sort of being a bit of a sort of you know, stickler for the rules. And I, I, yes, I just feel that I was thinking about him at school well, chiefly when I said that. I can't imagine yeah, that yeah, he caused yeah. much. Um, I can't imagine that he caused many problems for the teachers. No, at no, I, and, and even that, you know, but I, I think where it's a rule with um, with some kind of, you know, sort of uh, pe uh, penalty, mm. uh, um, yeah. you know, then certainly he's like a sort of rules bloke. Ah, so fear um, of punishment. I think where he can make it more murky, where it's more sort of, sort of moral, um, I think he, he's able to be more flexible and he, he feels that he really is different to the rest of us that that there are certain rules that don't apply to us I, 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 I was thinking actually um, one way of looking at it I don't even remember seeing uh, you remember the um, the um, the um, the um, body line yes um, um, series uh, uh, um, Douglas Johnson. Yes, there is in in um, Australia. Yeah, uh, in the nineteen twenties, thirties. Yeah, uh, and one of the uh, um, yeah, yeah, they the you know, one of the the, the sort of reasons why people were so aghast at, at the tactics used was was that 
um, you know, it was within the rules, but it was like sort of playing around with the rules a little bit. Yes. Um, so te- you know, they were technically uh, right, but the traditions yes. and, and expectations yes. and standards so were I being think, destroyed. There's a, a, there's a, yeah, there's a, 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 there's a place where he's happy to be technically correct, but also, you know, he's happy that sort of there's a moral ambiguity. But I, don't, I think you're right, uh, looking back at his career, but on this occasion, that doesn't work. That's not, that's not a get-out-of-jail-free card because he has described a measurably worse performance by Boris Johnson in glowing I terms. Think he, he, he is quite capable in his head yeah, that's of for being sure. able to defend um, what he said about Theresa May mm. and what he said about Boris Johnson. And I think part of that is background and breeding, um, you know, he is so very different. Part of it is, is his education. Um, so practised in being able to defend, you know, all kinds of you know, those sort of mm. positions. Um, you know, I mean, you know, Boris Johnson wrote those two different letters yes. about Brexit. Yeah, that's a really good and reminder. You can imagine Reece Mogg doing exactly the same thing, you know, um, you know, he has this innate moral flexibility um, in him. That's a very generous way of, of putting it. An his, innate moral flexibility almost sounds like an attribute, <laughs> Tim. I, I know exactly what you mean by it. Yeah, yeah, you know, he, 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 he sort of... <sighs> he's quite capable of having multiple positions on on one thing and being able to sort of choose whichever one is to the best of his advantage. And, and, it, I mean, and, and the truth be damned is the, is the brutal conclusion that we have to arrive at. And, and I think you've proved why all well, because like you, like me, it's almost like we can't find the words that we need to describe innate moral flexibility is a thing of beauty. But double yeah. think is what Orwell had to call it. He had to invent a new word to describe this level of dissembling in politics. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Tim, thank you. And yeah. I apologise for ambushing you with a complete non sequitur at the top of this call to the programme. If I'd known it was your first time, I wouldn't have done that. I do apologise. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Bye, there you go. Uh, and I only did it so I could plug last, uh, the last episode of Full Disclosure with, with Robert Lindsay, who, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this, is from Ilkeston in Derbyshire. <laughs> it's just like Tim, the last caller. It's 5 to 12. Darius is in Manchester. Darius, what do you reckon? Well... I hear they were talking about, a lot about witch hunts, but to my mind, the cabinet is sort of a necromantic cabal <laughs> brewing up trouble in a cauldron for the rest of the population. Yes, uh, but, I'm chuckling at your choice of words, not at the picture you're painting, because I think that's, that's <laughs> worryingly yeah. accurate. Yeah, right, go, going back to Mog, Mr Mog, sir. Yes. Uh, the first clip when he was talking about me, yes. the main thing that Mog was thinking about, although I would have thought sort of innately, Oh, I think it clicked out then. I just heard it go. I don't know what happened there. We'll try and get him back up. So uh, Joe's in Swanage in Dorset. Joe, what do you reckon? Um, so yesterday I watched quite a bit of TV and I was quite surprised by how um, how non-committal Jacob Rees-Mogg was on what he thought the result was going to be. Mm. So with public opinion and with um, the Jubilee and whatnot, I think that Jacob Rees-Mogg thought that, that uh, Boris Johnson would do a lot worse yesterday than he actually did. No, I disagree. <laughs> and um, you disagree with that? Yeah, they, they, I mean, I know that behind the scenes they were talking about between 100 to 130 and hoping that it would be at the lower end of that with a slim chance of it coming in in double figures and that would have been something they could claim as a, as a win. Uh, no, one, no one really, until Nadine Dorries launched that astonishing attack upon her own party and its preparedness for the for the pandemic in an attempt to throw yeah. Jeremy Hunt under a bus. I don't think anyone was was estimating it being over 130 by then. Never mind 148. So, so my my thing is, is I'm just trying to come up with a logical. Way yes, of course, you're do, you're doing the Sherlock Holmes thing. You're trying to eliminate yeah, the impossible. Trying, I'm come, yeah, I'm trying to come up with a logical way of you saying what a result that was a result, and that's the only way that I can think of. Oh, but you're if, just if a nice that, bloke, you see. Not, you're you're, you're not, not capable. True, Go on. Yeah, if that's not true, if that is not true, then, then, <laughs> I mean, it's Jacob Rees-Mogg, right? We're talking yeah. about, uh, we're talking about Boris Johnson. So, for example, when 
Jacob Rees-Mogg said it was terrible for Theresa May, yeah. back then there were the rules of the game. If you got X number of votes of no confidence, mm. it was a terrible result and Theresa May has gone. For the last two, three years since Boris Johnson the has rules been have in, been broken. the rule books have been... Yes, yeah, so it's, it's almost irrelevant um, what should happen. But all all the traditional Johnson. metrics have been torched. You're, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I, but I admire your... Your decency of spirit, actually, to be looking for a plausible reason that doesn't portray Jacob Rees-Mogg as the duplicitous little shill that he clearly or, or, or arguably um, has revealed himself to be. Thank you, Joe. I'm only cracking on because poor old Darius got cut off in his prime and I want to give him a minute to make his point. What's it going to be, Darius? Right, as quick as this. The first interview when Mogg was talking about May, he's mm. living in his now moment, which was then. Yes, okay? yes. He doesn't realise that things that have come from the past can affect the future, i.e. a recording of what he said yeah. then, which was his now. Yeah. So now he can come out with this uh, clap trap about how, well, Boris won the uh, confidence vote. <laughs> it's done brilliantly. And he's, he's forgotten <laughs> about what happened before. But again, all he's thinking about is the now. If the guy had another brain, he'd be a half-wit because he just doesn't realise what's happening. And this now situation, i.e. I am in the now now, it's just, it, it goes back to time. It, I think goes back to Neanderthals, I think. And, uh, Is it right? So it's like your lizard brain kicking in where you only deal it. with what's immediately in front of you and that, that becomes the sort of obsession with getting through one news cycle that Boris Johnson has now infected, in a sense, the entire news, the entire party. It doesn't matter what you said yesterday, never mind what you said three or four years ago, even if it completely contradicts what you're saying today, just focus on what I'm saying today. Don't look over there, look over here, look over here, look into my eyes, look into... I can't do that on the radio, it's against the rules, in case I accidentally hypnotise you. That'd be fun, though, wouldn't it? Um, it is... It's just gone 12 noon. I'll be a little bit late for the news. After which, I don't want to move on. Do you mind? I mean, we'll find another question focusing upon the current political landscape. Who, who feels excluded from the programme so far? If, you, if you, you haven't had an opportunity to join in, drop me a text or a tweet during the news bulletin, and I'll try and come up with a question after the news bulletin that allows you to take up a seat at this table. It's four minutes after 12, you're listening to James O'Brien. I think if, I, I'm thinking back to the Ludicrous Lee, that's what we call him, Ludicrous Lee Anderson. It makes him sound like an all-in wrestler, doesn't it? Ludicrous Lee Anderson describing the vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister as being a consequence of a witch hunt led by the BBC and the Labour Party. Quite incredible. But, but I, I suspect these days that the Conservative politician whose name appears most in my inbox is the former MP, Rory Stewart. And, of course, it's not that long ago. He was a, a leadership contender with, a, I think, a much better chance than many people realise of actually getting over the line uh, against Boris Johnson. Certainly, Boris Johnson supporters were worried enough to um, give some of, lend some of their votes to Jeremy Hunt in the penultimate ballot so that Rory Stewart would not go up against Boris Johnson in, in, in the final round. And when you see that there were 148 MPs prepared to vote against Boris Johnson yesterday, you perhaps get an indication of why that Machiavellian machination was undertaken by his uh, by, by Johnson's leadership campaign. And I'm delighted to tell you that Rory joins us now on the line. Rory, it's lovely to see you. Lovely um, to see you. How, how did you... Just give us a, a, a quick flavour of the historical significance of this as a, as, a, as a student of politics but also of course as a as a conservative politician um that the numbers are being downplayed by the usual suspects what's your overview of of, of last the, the, night's the event? numbers are huge um in fact as, as you'll know they were briefing out yesterday to almost anyone who'd listened that they thought that they'd be in trouble if they got to 130 which meant that really they thought they could keep it below 100 this is catastrophic for them because this is worse than what happened to Theresa May shortly before she was toppled. And the way to look at it is that there are basically 170 MPs voting for Boris Johnson who are either ministers or on the payroll in one way or another. So three quarters of his backbenchers have voted against him. Three quarters of the people who are free to vote against him have voted against him. That is a very, very bad situation. It's particularly strange because, as you know, he's only just over two years into office, apparently with a very large majority. So he's done something you know, unprecedented. I mean, Theresa May was toppled in this way when she basically lost an election. But for this to happen to him at this scale now is extraordinary. Um, were you surprised, personally? No. 
Um, I mean, sorry, I was surprised by how many managed to come that, out against that, That's what I mean, pleasantly, yes. Pleasantly surprised by that, yes. Do you have back channels? I mean, you speak, you must be still in touch with some former colleagues. Yeah. But... No, I, I speak to lots of colleagues, and um, many of them had reached out to me, and, and many of them are completely appalled and horrified. They're horrified not just that he's hanging on, but they're horrified about the way he's conducting himself, mm. the fact that he seems to be behaving as though it's business as usual. But I was still surprised by how many people voted against him because there is huge pressure put on by the whips. He will have personally written to every single person. He will have promised jobs to lots of people. I, I remember this when I was, um, when he reached out to me in 2016 when he was running for leadership against Theresa May. He's got a lovely way of doing it. He said to me, he said, Rory, I don't, don't believe anything that I'm about to say to you. Don't, don't believe a word, but, I, but I'd love to have you in my cabinet. And he would have been doing that to, a, to I guess, about 300 people. So um, the fact that, you know, 148 of them held out uh, shows just how deeply unpopular he is because there are strong forces of loyalty which will have yes. prevented many others from turning against him. There, there, there is a danger, and I don't know if we're engaging in it now, of analysing this through the lens of normality, of, of analysing this according to traditional trends, according to traditional relationships between actions and consequences, according to what has always gone before. And you, as much as anybody, know that we're in an era now and under an administration now that bears no resemblance whatsoever to what has gone before. So is there any case for arguing that however wounded he may be, he will stagger on uh, regardless? I think it's very likely he'll try to stagger on. I mean, it's very much in his character. And he, he ignores all types of conventions. You see, his, the one he's done most dramatically recently is because he's... <laughs> He's under pressure to resign for breaking the ministerial code and lying in parliament. He's tried to change the ministerial code so that you no longer have to resign. So he does this kind of stuff all the time. I think, though, he is very badly wounded. And if the Conservative Party make the mistake of leaving him in power, mm. he will take them into an election that he will lose. And he will uh, hand the country over to probably at the moment it looks like a coalition between Labour and maybe the SNP. But in any case, people in the Conservative Party backing him will be deeply, deeply regretting this. I mean, in every way, because they must be going home to their families. Their partners must be saying to them, you're crazy. Their constituents are saying they're crazy. It's becoming a sort of weird personality cult. I thought Jesse Norman's intervention yesterday was particularly interesting. While all of the loyalists were trumpeting the vaccine rollout as a success, Kate Bingham's husband resigned a, a role in government. Yeah, I thought that was an amazing letter. And if people haven't read it, it's, it's out there on Twitter. But he, he's very good at explaining that Boris is also exploding all the things that would make someone like Jesse Norman, who's a, an old fashioned conservative, um, the things that brought him into the party. So he talks about the fact that he's a conservative because he believes in, in prudence and restraint respect for tradition, all of that stuff, Boris, is blowing up. How do you respond to the suggestion that one of the things that's saving him is the absence of anybody who could obviously replace him? And, and I suppose I should ask you, although you probably won't answer, whether, whether you would anoint anybody in the current um, front line as a, as a possible successor, a possible replacement. Um, so I, I wouldn't anoint anybody, but I'd say that almost anybody <laughs> is better than him. I think he's one of the most terrible human beings imaginable. I mean, human I beings, think, not politicians. Yeah, I think he's a terrible human being as well as a terrible, terrible prime minister. I mean, he's, you know, he's personally dishonest and I think a, a shoddy character. You, you, so I think there are probably about 200 conservative MPs who'd be a better prime minister than, than he would be. You, you're um, less diplomatic than you were when we last sat down in person because I asked you whether he was dangerous and you paused for, for, for so long that it made the newspapers. I think it was a nine second pause that, <laughs> that, that before, before. So you've clearly you've come off on the fence that, that not that you were on it. But but are you surprised? What did I, what did I eventually say? After you did time? eventually say, yes, he is. He is dangerous. <laughs> and you drew, as you often do, upon your personal interactions with him when you were both at the Foreign Office and, and, and the, the perceived betrayals, not just most obviously of Nazim, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, but, but also, um, uh, you know, of, of, of people that would have expected traditionally to get help from a British government. But, I, I, I mean, you've known him almost all your life, really, haven't you, in one sense or another, albeit by degrees of separation. Have you been surprised by how appalling he has proved to be, or, or, or did yes, you yes, see I think I, Yes, I think um, it's only when you actually see him running something that you really see how bad it is. So he's somebody that I disapproved of yes. and that I thought was, um, you know, I, I, there's a lot of his early life lying and being 
fired from his job as a journalist, his time in the Bullingdon Club, this kind of stuff disturbed me. But it's only when you actually see how somebody who lies and doesn't have a sense of shame tries to run a government department that you see what the problem is, which is basically that you can't really lead or motivate anybody. He can't inspire anyone because there's no sense of follow through. There's no sense of conviction. And therefore, he can't get anything done. I mean, that's at the core of this letter you were talking about from Jesse Norman, that there's no sense really that if he was left in for another two and a half years, he'd achieve anything. We wouldn't have an energy policy. We wouldn't really have a recovery from COVID. There wouldn't be any leveling up because all he's doing minute by minute is struggling to try to survive from the latest scandal. And if he survives this one, there'll be another one next week. Um, finally, and, and perhaps unfairly, I'm just going to, because you mentioned people won't be loyal or, or there, there are always people who will. And, and again, drawing upon your knowledge of the party and, 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 and elements of a shared background with this, this politician, I'm going to play you how Jacob Rees-Mogg responded to the last vote of no confidence in Theresa May and then a quick snatch of how he responded to last night's events. And I'll invite you, as I've been inviting my callers for the last hour, to, to try to make sense of it. So here he is talking about Theresa May's result. This is a very bad result for the Prime Minister. 117 votes against her, much worse than she thought. And here he is talking about Boris Johnson's result last night. Good victory for the Prime Minister. Uh, he won comfortably and now he is getting on business. Can you make sense of that for us, Rory Stewart? No, I think it's. I think it speaks for itself. It's outrageous. And actually, if you play more of Jacob's quote, he said about Theresa May that the main reason she needed to go was the overwhelming majority of the backbenchers were against her. And in this case, far more of the backbenchers were against Boris. Everything that Jacob Rees-Mogg said means that Boris Johnson should go. Are you surprised to see people like him becoming caught up in the in the in the Johnson? Um, uh, I don't know what one would call no, it malaise. No, sadly, I'm afraid he's been um, in on this from the beginning. I think it's very very disturbing, and I think the people who compromised with Boris Johnson and joined his early cabinets. I think I'm. I feel you know. I think it's a great great pity. I think people should stay as far away from the man as possible. Well, Roy Stewart, many thanks indeed, as always, for, for your time and, uh, and, you. and, and your thoughts today. Um, it is 12.14. Rory, of course, until not that long ago, was very much a leading light in the Conservative Party and seen by many as a potential future leader or certainly a potential future Foreign Secretary. I suspect that the, um, many people feel a sense of loss listening to that sort of analysis now from, from possibly even both sides of the House of Commons, but certainly from the disaffected ranks of Conservatives who we've been talking to a lot today. Uh, not everybody's happy. I'll just read this one out from Chris. He writes, O'Brien never mentions news covering bikers, like that 41% of councils don't allow use of bus lanes and more and more free motorcycle parking is being removed despite the advantages to reducing pollution and congestion. Mate, I can only say sorry. I'll, I'll try and do better in the future. But at the moment, I think I'm making the right decisions about where we should be focusing our energies and attentions. I need to come up with a, with a new question after this, which hopefully will invite... But when I said if you're feeling... Ah, oh, Chris, mate. When I said if you're feeling excluded from the conversation, I didn't mean, like, make a suggestion about a completely different topic. I meant we're talking about Boris Johnson's loss in the vote of no confidence, but by confining it to disaffected conservatives or or people who could have a view on how Jacob Rees-Mogg can lie straight in bed after coming out with such appalling, dissembling nonsense. It was more about that than than make a suggestion about a completely new topic. I mean, I'll put bikes on the long list, but for the short list, it's got to be something we might do for the next 45 minutes. So any thoughts on that? And I'll come up with a question after this. It's 12.18 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I'm not, not sure everybody's taken my suggestion that you come up with the next question terribly seriously, although I can tell you for nothing, there's a lot of admiration out there for Rory Stewart, even from people who would never in a million years contemplate voting for the Conservative Party, so the polar opposite, if you like, of people to whom we dedicated the first hour of the programme. Um, but a lot of people mentioned Keir Starmer, didn't they? And I think we might do that now. For, for the duration until it's Sheila time because I, I think it is politically significant. I think it's of national importance that when you have a lame duck of a prime minister, a, a, a prime minister... Look, I'll tell you what Boris Johnson is doing now and, and I don't want... I, I'm going to use some theoretical examples but I don't want you to read too much into them. Uh, uh, he, he is hoping for a catastrophe of sorts. Like he's hoping for a General Galtieri to invade the Falkland Islands. He's hoping for the mother of all distractions from the current reality and something that might give him an opportunity to, to reinflate this burst balloon of um, 
of 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 a of a politician. So Ukraine is is cited often as something he's got right. I'm not aware of any senior politician from either party who would have done anything differently with regard to Ukraine. I'm genuinely not aware of any senior politician from either the Conservative, the Labour, or the Liberal Democrat Party, the Green Party, or the SNP or Plaid Cymru, who would have done anything differently with regard to Ukraine. We could move further and faster than many of our European allies because our dependency upon gas coming via pipeline from Russia was crushingly lower, was was much, much lower. Um, And, of course, Joe Biden had already established a template of what military aid for Ukraine looked like after Donald Trump had sought to make it contingent on getting Zelensky to uh, join him in his corrupt pursuit of of Joe Biden's son. So, you know, that's just a given. But, of course, it doesn't matter in a world of client journalism and propaganda that the portrayal of Ukraine as some sort of big win for Boris Johnson is, is effective. Um, and yes, Zelensky will be pleased or will say that he's pleased or has said, I think, to the Financial Times editor today that he's pleased Boris Johnson is staying because it's good to have an ally in post. But Zelensky is a clever operator and he would be saying that about any other prime minister who had done what was good for Ukraine. And what is good for Ukraine is, of course, not necessarily anything to do with what is good for the United Kingdom. Zelensky doesn't really care, and nor should he, for the record, about the cost of living crisis here, because he's got 800 dead children (laughs) uh, on his hands as a consequence of Vladimir Putin's ongoing aggression. So all he cares about is what is good for Ukraine. So let's all park the idea now that Ukraine is a big enough... Uh, distraction or a big enough win, in quotes, for Boris Johnson to somehow counterbalance all the horrors that he's inflicted on his own country and continues to inflict upon his own country and, crucially, perhaps, his own party. But the fact remains that a lame duck prime minister should be on the end of a, 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 a stick now, being toasted, like a manky old marshmallow by the leader of the opposition. I don't know that I explained myself very well earlier when I suggested that actually what many perceive as Keir Starmer's weaknesses should be perceived as strengths. That that arguably sounds a little bit sycophantic on my part. But what I meant was, and I'll try again, what I meant was that I find myself irritated when Keir Starmer speaks or delivers, all right, I'm going to do something now that I don't always do. I'm going to I'm going to take off the straight jacket that I normally apply to my ego before I come on the radio in the morning. I know what you're thinking. It's not a very effective straight jacket, is it, Jimbo? But I'll tell you what I sometimes think. And you've heard me blathering on for long enough and you've heard me engage with people and you've heard my monologues and my turns of phrase now. For, 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 for this, I hope to make some sense. There are occasions when I see a Keir Starmer with an open goal in front of him and he, 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 he doesn't miss, but neither does he slam it home at 100 miles an hour. And, and the speech yesterday, the little statement he gave yesterday after Boris Johnson's vote of no confidence, straight jacket will go back on after this, all right? I look at that and I think I could do so much better than that. Or if I was writing a speech, I could do so much better than that. He's not zinging it. He's not landing it. He's not absolutely bossing it. He's not, in other words, somebody that would have been a brilliant debater at public school. And because I come from that background, and I was a brilliant debater at public school, I can't shake the notion that that really matters. Right, ego straitjacket back on. My God, it shouldn't matter. It took me 48 years to realise this. Well, that's not quite true. Let's say 30 years, from the end of the sixth form to... Two or three years ago. It really shouldn't matter. Being good at that stuff, and I nearly swore then, being good at that stuff gives absolutely no indication whatsoever of whether or not you will be good at governing a country or even running a bath. Being able to destroy an opponent in a debating chamber, being able to deliver beautifully turned phrases, being able to deliver rhetorical flourishes like verbal fireworks, all of these things are effective in the context of a debate or in the context of PMQs or in a speech to conference or in a statement to in response to a loss of confidence in a prime minister or even in a party political broadcast. Being able to set off verbal fireworks shouldn't be valued as much as it is in this country. 
All right, and I can say that because I'm like a Guy Fawkes of verbal fireworks. But it shouldn't matter. My skill set should not matter anywhere near as much as it does in British politics. Even to the extent that absolute no marks like Jacob Rees Mogg, who couldn't punch his way out of a wet paper bag in a proper intellectual engagement with anybody, can somehow score points from the judges by throwing in some quotes he got out of the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations 10 minutes ago, or some barely remembered Latin from his from his school days. The skill set, it's probably a post-empire thing, that, that the skill set that we value and even revere in this country when it comes to rhetoric, when it comes to public speaking, when it comes to debating, is worthless when it comes to actually doing the business of government. I don't think I even realised this when Theresa May fell apart during her speech at the conference a few years ago. Do you remember when the but poor woman had a dreadful cough when some comedian had jumped up on the stage and handed her a fake P45. And then to cap it all, one of the letters on the conservative slogan behind her actually fell off the wall and bounced across the stage. Even then, I think I was giving it some, oh, she should be a better speaker than this. I don't know what changed. I think possibly. And then you've got the Mail on Sunday story, that disgusting apology for journalism, referring to uh, Angela Rayner and her genitals, and claiming that because Boris Johnson has brilliant debating skills, Oxford Union debating skills, Angela Rayner somehow has to flash her nether regions at him in order to distract him during House of Commons debates, written by a man called Glenn Owen in a newspaper edited by a man called David Dillon, because people like that often hide away from responsibility for their own actions, so it's important to give them a name check on the big show. Uh, that that kind of mindset, imagine thinking that o Boris Johnson's Oxford Union debating skills were so amazing that you're now going to inflict a disgusting misogynistic attack upon the deputy leader of the Labour Party. So that's what I think might be the problem, and I could be completely wrong. I could be completely wrong. But I think that Starmer's weaknesses might be his strengths. I think that I found myself in the middle of lockdown when Boris Johnson was skipping Cobra meetings and telling lies about world-beating test and trace systems and letting cronies trouser millions and millions of pounds of our money simply because they happened to know somebody in his administration, so they got put to the front of the queue, all of that. I yearned for dullness. I yearned for it. But I wonder whether we're ever really ready for it. I think possibly we were when John Major replaced Margaret Thatcher. But I wonder whether we ever really want dullness, unless you're coming out of a war, unless you're coming out of a period of absolute mayhem, in which case a safe and steady pair of hands. May tried to do it, didn't she, when she coined the strong and stable slogan. Very much an acknowledgement of what I'm trying to articulate to you. After the madness of Brexit, we need strong and stable government. She wasn't, I don't think, in the final analysis, equipped to provide it. But I think we're in that situation again now, as Brexit becomes real, as, as Project Fear becomes Project Here, and as the pandemic hopefully slips further and further into the background, and as the absolute carnage of Boris Johnson's administration begins finally to start eating itself, what do you want from the leader of the opposition, if not strength and stability, if not a safe pair of hands, if not calmness, and even, dare I say, dullness? So that's why I think it's a little bit previous of people to complain or to suggest that Keir Starmer is not doing enough to win their admiration. And I say that only because I know how arrogant that sounds. Oh, I understand the way you're thinking even better than you do. I say that only because I think, like me, when you find yourself in that position, you're thinking, oh, I wish he could set off a few more fireworks because I really like fireworks. Oh, look, a rocket. We all like fireworks. Don't don't phone in to tell me that you don't like fireworks. It's a figure of speech, all right? We all like fireworks, unless you're firework phobic. We all like fireworks. Keir Starmer doesn't do fireworks. He's never going to do fireworks. He's not going to try to learn to do fireworks. He's, he's far too um, comfortable in his own skin to try to adopt a, a, a new identity, to try to become a show pony. He doesn't want to be. He doesn't do fireworks. 
Is that fair? Is it because he doesn't do fireworks that you're not warming to him? Or am I being too kind to the leader of the opposition? And in fact, the problem is a little bit deeper. The reason why, and look, the plural of anecdote is never going to be data. But I think almost every caller, certainly at the top of the show, the first two, three, four callers, all coming from very different perspectives. All they had in common, really, was a lifelong commitment to, to voting conservative. All of them now uh, are cut loose by Boris Johnson's administration. But all of them also, if I remember correctly, mentioning that Keir Starmer wasn't doing enough yet to tempt them into his fold. Now, is it is it the James O'Brien theory of fireworks that explains why Starmer isn't mopping up the support you might be expecting him to? Although they're 23 points ahead in one of the... Um, constituencies that's up for grabs i don't know is the short answer what 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 do you think he should be doing differently is a more interesting question for me to ask than than why don't you like him as much as you might do what what do you think keir starmer should be doing differently is the question i want you to answer all right thank you davy who doesn't like fireworks oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need what should keir star if anything what should Keir Starmer be doing differently? It's 12.31. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. 12.35 is the time. Enough about Johnson. Let's talk about Starmer. Tracy's in Finchley. Tracy, what would you like to say? I've been phoning you for 15 years, and this is the first time I have ever plucked up the courage to call you about anything political. Gosh. Well, yeah. you've certainly built, you've built up some anticipation now, Tracy. Don't blow it. I hope I hope I won't. <laughs> don't don't test me too much. It's not my strong suit, but, but but I feel really strongly about this. I would love to love Keir Starmer more, right? And it's all about the delivery and the voice. Uh, and I've been thinking about this for the last little while. Yes, I think about um, Ed Miliband. If he hadn't got in and David had, mm. things would have been very, very different. I think it was his voice that put people off. And I know it sounds so shallow and so, so awful. I think Obama was a magnificent speaker. I thought his voice was fabulous. Cameron, great. Quasi Kwartang, great. Sadiq Khan, dreadful. Pritchi Patel, can't pronounce her G's. I know it's all incredibly superficial, but when Boris Johnson speaks, he could be literally talking rubbish. Yes. And for whatever reason, you listen and you think, so what did he just say? Yeah. Sorry, sorry, that's absolute rubbish. But the way he delivers it is so convincing that even though you know he's talking BS, it's you, you, it, you it, have it to gets, listen. It gets it's, through. It gets under the wires. Yes, I, I mean, all, you've... You've included Obama, which was clever because it slightly knocks the stuffing out of my next question, but not completely because we're yeah. talking about something linked to class here, aren't we? No, not necessarily. No? Not necessarily. No, not necessarily. I think it is It is to do with passion. It is to do with, dare I say it, or, actually. Or, or it's not genuine just, passion, though, is it? Because Keir Starmer no, is a passionate right, man. I mean, his, the, his work yeah. in domestic violence, his work as DPP, was was truly not, passionate. Johnson's not passionate about anything except, well, no, the obvious. But it's not what he's saying. It's how he's saying it. Yeah. And I think he just has a slightly unfortunate nasal twang. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that because loads of people have... Uh, we all speak so, in, in same our Same with Ed and, and he looks down a lot. So well, what I really like about this, and you must ring me more often about politics because your honesty is incredibly refreshing. You, you, you're acknowledging that it's very shallow, but you're saying this actually works for me. And what you're describing... And this, where, this is where Obama's inclusion in your list yeah. works very well. You're describing people who are really, really good at that whole kind of university debating yes. world. A hundred percent. And it shouldn't matter. And, and it shouldn't have any bearing. It doesn't have any no, bearing on how good you'd be no, as a minister. But, but, no, it, but it works. It wins votes. No, no absolutely right. It, it is purely about having the, the conviction and having the, the voice that will... I don't know, maybe it's just a general type of voice that mm. appeals to a broad spectrum of people and, and the, the tugging the forelock thing drives me mental. Of course, I, I can't bear that. Yes. But actually, wh who else have we got? Even Neil Kinnock, he didn't have a particularly pleasant voice to listen to, but a very passionate man. He was a great orator, Kinnock. I he think. was a great uh, orator. He was I, I, great I personally, orator. I did like his voice, but it's, it's horses for courses. I, I yes. give you that. Yes. And, and funnily enough, Gordon Brown has grown on me. 
Yes. I used I, I used to find him a very difficult person to listen to. I used to find his facial um, tics very strange because he clearly wasn't comfortable sort of being in front of the camera. But I think he's the most he was the most wonderful politician and had so much important stuff to say. But for whatever reason, people didn't get on with it. It's optics it, or, or whatever you yeah. want to call it. It, and it. And I mean, I wish it didn't matter. It's all very well. Someone let me read you some criticism of me rather than you. Here's one. For God's sake, get over the voice. Learn to get over the superficial. It's your problem, not Starmer's. And I think we'd both agree with that. We'd both say, yes, of course, in an objective universe, yep. these things wouldn't matter. But if you want to win a general election, you have to acknowledge that they do. And suddenly, Tracy, uh, referencing yes. the fact that you're calling from Finchley, the fact that Margaret Thatcher's voice changed almost beyond recognition in the journey from backbench to Downing Street becomes absolutely incredibly relevant, doesn't it? Absolutely. Well, there it is. Keep in touch. Thank you, Will <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. 15 years. I can't remember. I haven't been here that long, have I? 12.39 is the time. Olivia is in Bath. Olivia, what do you think? Hi, James. Hello. Well, I was just thinking, I think we're just very used to these populist politicians, you know, Trump and Boris and Farage. I think we're really underestimating Keir Starmer for his, as you said, his weaknesses, perceived weaknesses being his strengths. Yes. I think it's good that he is quite measured, that he can sort of swinging insults. He, th- he can even think maybe what the other side are thinking and very empath- empath- empathic. I think that's the right word. Yes. Very empathic man. I think we're just very used to it. And in a sense, even Jeremy Corbyn was quite a populist politician. There was all that furor around it. And when has yes. that ever worked out for us recently? You, know, uh, I think maybe you mean a, po- a populist who's turned out to be good for the population? I don't think... A bit thin on the ground, evidence. aren't they? Really? Yeah. But you, so, I mean, where do you sit? Where's your dial on this? Because if you're on side with Starmer, regardless of his personal style then you're not the kind of voter he needs to win over. He needs to win over people like Tracy and Finchley, doesn't he? Oh, definitely. I'm going to vote for him. So, really, he can ignore me. I, <laughs> I never would um, ignore you. Just, <laughs> see, But he wouldn't lose your vote if he... If well, I don't think he's ever going to do it. I mean, you can't get to the top of the legal tree in this country without being possessed of a pretty impressive skill set. Definitely. And, and, and being a fireworks artist was not needed to become DPP. I wish it wasn't needed to become Prime Minister, but I genuinely do think it would help. Yeah, me too. I, I wish it wasn't something that people put so much store by. I mean, it's true what your previous caller said, mm. that people do take notice of things um, about his, about voices and accents. And it's a shame, really. I mean, I personally have, have not got a placement in London because with my northern voice, thought I couldn't handle the big city. Oh, no. <laughs> that was the feedback I got. So it's a shame. I think it's something we need to change. Well, And it, is, in, it is inherently and inextricably tied to the class structure, the class status quo. Not not necessarily completely. There are other factors going on, but, but there is something very class-based about it, as you allude to, Olivia. And as Jess points out, Tracy talking about how Boris Johnson speaks, and, and he is often credited as being a good orator. By, by all normal measures, he isn't a good orator. He doesn't have clarity of, of, uh, of delivery. I, I mean, Jez writes it best. He says he can't form a sentence, for God's sake, without erring, umming and erring all the time. He's a hopeless orator. But he's not. He's an effective orator. He brings a room with him. That led by donkeys, it's about eight or nine minutes of, of footage going right back to that school teacher saying that he seems to think it's churlish, churlish of us to expect him to abide by the standards that bind us all. Um, also includes stuff of him at the Oxford Union, the full white tie and all of that malarkey all doled up to the nines. And he, I, I know what he would have been like. I'll give you an example, all right? I'll give you an example from, from because if you didn't go to a school like mine or, or a university debating, you might still not quite know what I mean. And I, I'll give you an example. So imagine a debate at the LSE. And I won't tell you whether or not it was me that said this because it's, a, it's, it's well, I, it will become clear. And you've got a bloke from public school, very comfortable in that um environment very much to the manner born capable of knows how to read a room crack a joke bring them with him and then you've got a very passionate representative of the uh, lgbt society as it was then or probably just lgb society actually back in, in in the early 1990s and stands up in the audience and objects to something that the public schoolboy has said because it was it was very male centric it was it was uh, heterocentric it was an observation that presumed everybody in the room was heterosexual right 
So it's the kind of thing Boris Johnson would have been very good at at college. And, and you can uh, disagree with me when I suggest to you this is the kind of card he would have played. So you've got the, the head of the LGB society objecting to a posh public school bloke on the stage at the debating society because he said something, I can't remember what, that made it sound as if he thought everybody in the room was heterosexual. And she's on her feet. She's got right on her side. She is absolutely doing the work of the good. She is. She, But he simply says... Well, madam, I, I think you'll just find that you haven't found the right man yet. And in the early 90s, it wouldn't happen now, but in the early 90s, that would have brought the house down at an Oxbridge debating society. The, the, the denial that, that lesbianism even existed would have brought the house down in that sort of environment, in that sort of era. But my God, it's hardly evidence that you should be trusted with the flipping sandwiches, let alone with, with, with governance or with responsibility or power. And that's what I'm talking about. That ability to make a, to, to know what will and won't work in a specific moment, simply in terms of rhetorical flourish or the ignition of a firework. And, and that's why people aren't warming to Starmer. And I don't think it should matter, but I think that it does. And I don't know what the answer is to that conundrum. Do you? It's 12.45. 12.48 is the time. Enough for now about Johnson. Let's talk about the other fella. Gillian is in Mitcham. Gillian, what would you like to say? Hello there. Um, Hello. I need to know what Keir's, um his ideas are. What are his plans? If he wants my vote, I need to know what his ideas are yes. about uh, the NHS, about social housing, about education. Is he going to reinstate the ministerial code or is he going to leave it as is in the shadow? Well, it hasn't been changed yet, so he can't, he can't answer oh. that one. But I wonder whether... Would we normally get this before a general election? Do we normally... I mean, because you don't publish your manifesto two years out, do you? Would we normally expect a leader of the opposition to have a to, would we to have a clearer vision of what he's going to do? We know the windfall tax was a big thing, don't we? They, they were very much on side with the windfall tax, and now that the Tories have nicked it, it kind of leaves him a bit potless. I, I think it's important that we do know what his ideas are yes. about these sorts of things. How can I give him my vote if I don't know what he plans to do if he gets into power, yeah. I need to know. My son said to me, "Yes, uh, plan. if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Give me your ideas, give me your plans, care, so I know whether or not you will get my vote. I like That's it. what I need to know. I'm, I'm sure he's a bright lad, Gillian, but I don't think he came up with that one all by himself. Well, that's what he told me. <laughs> Sounds like a man <laughs> after my own heart. <laughs> there you go. But, I, I, I mean, if I were here to, to bat for Keir Starmer, which I'm not, then I would suggest that it is early doors, but it's certainly something he is going to have to do as, as, as the clock ticks. The closer you get to a general election, the more important it is to have a clear idea of precisely what you would be voting for in terms of policy. But, you know, in a way, Gillian speaks to the broader conversation that we're having as well, because... Uh, what did Boris Johnson stand for, uh, except getting Brexit done, which didn't really mean anything, but didn't matter because you had this sort of fireworks phenomenon going on at the same time. Uh, 12.50 is the time. Thank you, Gillian. Regards to your boy. David in Leicester. Dave, what would you like to say? Just picking up a similar point to your, your previous speaker. Yes. And I'm a Labour Party member and have been for a number of years. I describe myself as being left of centre. Yes. But what I don't see from him is passion. If you look, if you take something like Burnham or even Corbyn at two different extremes within the Labour Party, yeah. they speak with passion, conviction. He just doesn't come across like that to me. There's no, no, there's no dynamism there. Yeah, well, dynamism I, is, 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 is another word. Passion. See, we are talking about speaking style here rather than content and substance, though, aren't we, Dave? No, no, but we need both. We need content. As your previous speaker said, we need content and, and energy and dynamism. And without that, there's no leadership. You've got to I'm going to pick You've you up to... on this. I'm going to pick yeah. you up on this because I don't think that being a passionate speaker provides any indication whatsoever of whether you would be a good prime minister. I, I, I agree with you. Oh. You need to back that up with substance and strategy. Mm. Back it up with those two, with the passion and the dynamism, and then you've got a plan, a cunning plan. A cunning plan. I don't know if he needs a cunning plan. I couldn't resist that. <laughs> and yeah, and, and if you had to choose between the two, I, th I think we'd all choose a really impressive policy platform because I'm not sure that fireworks and dynamism are, are 
on the table. I don't think they're up but, but, on but, offer. But actually, but actually, that's what we need within the Labour Party. We need that. We need that balance between the, the vision, dynamism and strategy. Yeah. Because to, what to we're doing, yeah, because we need to legislate for the real world. We need to talk about winning elections in the real world, not in the world that we wish was real, where being exactly. very good at speaking or debating or, or having an ability but, to set but, off Catherine wheels doesn't matter. We live in a world where it does, full stop, which is why Tracy and Finchley were such a brilliant first call on this one. And, and that's why your comments um, about the, the debating style of... Mm. of of Johnson. I mean, it is very good. It is very convincing. Yeah. And, that, and, and that's the downfall. Even when you can have... see through it, you can still see how it works and you oh, can still fall yeah, for it occasionally. Can, he, he convinces people. He cons people. He's very good. He's a bloody good salesman. Mm. He is very good. But clearly, what he doesn't have is a substance behind that. And of course, um, a, a level of honesty and truth and responsibility. Yeah. And... Well, he sold an entire country a box with a picture of a toaster on it and convinced 52% of them that there was a toaster inside when really it was full of old bricks. Nicely put, Dave. Thank you. Francis is in Warminster. Francis, what do you think? Um, hello, James. Hello. Um, I think one of the problems we've got with Keir Starmer is his lack of ability to have a position in the media that is not about either Boris Johnson's behaviour mm or particularly over the last couple of years, he's actually, as opposition, his job has been to support the government yes. in pretty much all that it's been doing. And so... Even even as the leader of the government attacks him for not supporting them, that, that again is an example of yeah. the street skills, if you like, or the, or the, 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 the things you wish didn't work in politics working. Starmer is offering full-throated support on everything from yeah. Ukraine he, to, to a lot of the COVID policy and Johnson stands up and says you, 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 yeah, you weren't with us at all. Say, I, nobody should get vaccinated in this country. Labour are totally against vaccination. I, 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 just, just, just to be opposition, I, you know. I know. Um, I know you're right. And, so he hasn't got, he hasn't carved out his own space yet and that I think may be largely due to circumstance rather than... It's a lot about circumstance because obviously he was elected um, and came into office mm. after the pandemic had started and I think I was reminded of this really yesterday morning when he was on with Nick. Yes. I didn't listen to all of it, but oh. from what I heard, he was talking about Boris Johnson. Right. And not talking about I Boris Johnson. He can only Johnson respond listening. to the questions he's asked, so I don't know what the callers yeah. were saying. And, and, and after the vote of yeah. no confidence, or, or, or prior to the vote of no before, confidence, yeah. it's a bit inevitable. But you're dead right, actually. But no, yeah, you're but dead he, right. He needs to stop. I'm sure he'd fault. love to. I, I, we barely spoke yeah. about Boris Johnson when I did my full disclosure interview with him because because it's yeah, a bit. It, well, then you'll know it's, it's designed to find out more about him, and I hope you did find out more about him. But that sticks out like a sore thumb in the context of his public appearances, doesn't it? Yes, it do does, and it's you know also he's obviously got the um, what's it opposition media for yeah. him as well. Yeah, well, that's true. It, you know, he's not being given a free ride in any of the papers. What He's smug on one of them this morning, I think I saw. That's an astonishing smug. front page on the Daily Mail. Well, I mean, it is. is that the mail? Uh, yeah, but David Aranovich of The Times has, has described it quite perfectly as, as the worst kind of propaganda. In fact, Francis, I, I'm going to jump on that as a, as, as, as a quick reminder from you and let people know exactly how Aranovich um, uh, uh, picked apart this Daily Mail front page because it is always interesting to see this there it is. So, by the way, he writes, the Mail's front page this morning is a work of pure propaganda in the literal sense. It links a supposed physical characteristic, Starmer's smirk, which Francis just uh, uh, alluded to, to a non-existent threat, i.e. a coalition of chaos, while heroizing Johnson's response to a major setback. Um, uh, it also takes its readers for either Tory zealots or idiots, which is unwise in either instance. And this is as 148 Tory MPs hit the self-destruct button by opening door to smirking Starmer's coalition of chaos. And there is a picture on the front page of Keir Starmer smiling in quite a, I would say, normal fashion. Well, Boris Johnson is, I don't know quite how you'd describe his lips or indeed why any journalist would be trying to. It's uh, coming up to 12.57. Thank you, Francis. Last word on this, probably, because it's nearly Sheila time and there's something I want to leave you with to Matt in Kilburn. Matt, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Thanks for taking my call. You're very welcome. Um, I, I, I think it's something that I've thought about for quite a while because I'm, I'm sort of a, a Lib Lab supporter. I've yes. had three years. I've never, I've never supported um, Tories, but I have. I did listen to your podcast with um, with um, Sir Keir, and I yeah. thought it was interesting. I've got a lot of time for the guy. I, I genuinely do, and I think I'm one of those voters who's probably a bit less 
um, difficult to win over than some because I think he stands for one thing for me primarily above everything else. And he stands for integrity. Yes. So for your, for your question as to what he should do differently, I, I, I don't think he should do anything differently because that's who he is. Yes. And, and either you buy into that or you, or you don't. But there's been some great, great contributions from, I was very aligned with what Tracy said. I'd mm. always thought that when I listen to him speak, I feel like I'm listening to Ed Miliband. Yes. Um, which, is, which for me, from an oratory point of view, isn't necessarily a good thing. Sure. But, but we're talking about leadership credentials. Ultimately, that, that's, that's what this comes down to. And some people have it and some people don't. And I think Gordon Brown didn't have it. Tony Blair did. Yeah. Um, some people are, are born to, to support. And, and maybe, you know, that's going to be his role moving forward is that there's going to be someone else in the party who's got a little bit more fireworks, to use your word, or a bit mm. more ability to generate Oof. admiration. And he's just going to be that really strong bastion of integrity that, 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 that plays Depend, that Depending on what Durham Constabulary do in the next few weeks, of course. Although, actually, his, his status as a bastion of integrity doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily get diminished by, by either verdict coming down from Durham. Um, Matt, thank you very much. And speaking of things on the horizon, you've got two by-elections and a Privileges Committee investigation into whether or not Boris Johnson lied to the House of Commons. And, of course, now that we know 148 MPs are prepared to vote against him, in a secret ballot, you only need 40-odd to vote against him in a public ballot for any vote of no confidence in the House of Commons to actually be carried or any vote suggestion from the Privileges Committee to suspend him. Um, what normally happens in these circumstances, is a rather winning quote from you from the podcast that Rory Stewart does with uh, Alistair Campbell. It's called The Rest is, Rest is Politics. It's very, very good. And I'll leave you with this thought. Apparently, the standard practice, and it's talking about when Prime Ministers are as wounded as Boris Johnson is now because the level of support he got yesterday from his own MPs, the, the, the percentage that voted no confidence in him is the same as what Margaret Thatcher had just before she went and even lower than what John Major and Theresa May had when they faced their own personal uh, Rubicon. So here's the quote about what normally happens when MPs are as wounded as Boris Johnson. Apparently the standard practice is for the chief whip to enter the PM's office with a glass of brandy and a revolver and suggest that it's time to do the right thing. The only problem is that Johnson is likely to drink the brandy and shoot the chief whip. It's coming up to one o'clock. Here's Sheila Fogarty. Um, as I walked in earlier and you'd been talking about voices and language mm. and posh voices, um, I think it must have gone into your bones a little talking about it because as I walked in, you, you said, yes. <laughs> yes, did I? Oh, yes. dear. It was terribly jubilee. <laughs> yes. Thank you, James. 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 Thank you, James.